Co-chair of Storytelling and Partnerships for Do the Work, uh, he, him, his pronouns, and you're joining for another episode of our dual interview conversation series, Hey Fam. The further we push our conversation past Pride Month, the more it's clear. Pride for us is every single day, and we're here to make sure that it's that way for the rest of the advertising industry as well. Before we jump in, Do the Work is a queer, creative community and platform empowering the ad industry and marketers alike to inspire reward and celebrate queer creativity within marketing and advertising culture. We know the active inclusion for queer talent unleashes create untapped creative potential to advance business. When we're ourselves, everyone wins. Um, I'm going to leave that little <laughs> mess up just to be myself. Uh, so today with Hey Fam, we're having a discussion to explore how we and you stay creative and connect with queer creativity, especially during this ongoing quarantine, to keep inspired and to do the damn work. So here's what you can expect. First of all, amazing guests. Uh, Winter Mendelssohn is the founder and CEO of Posture Media, an independent full service creative and marketing studio based in Brooklyn. Posture services expand across strategy, branding, design, content production, paid media activation, consulting, and more. As a champion of diversity, inclusion, and intersectionality, Winter is passionate about creating opportunities for women, people of color, and LGBTQIA talent in advertising and marketing. Our second guest is cultural strategist at Sparks and Honey, June Park. They're one of the founding members of GLAD's Campus Ambassador Program and a recipient of GLAD's first Rising Stars Grant, which annually honors LGBTQIA changemakers across the nation. Since then, they've been featured in publications like Seventeen, Teen Vogue, and the Huffington Post, where they continue to bring visibility to the next generation of leaders. June is an alum of the Ad Color Futures program and is the first transgender non-binary mixed ad color. They chat for about half an hour. Uh, and then from there, we go into uh, a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. Because creativity is a positive energy, um, questions are allowed to be challenging and honest in these discussions, but they should also be kind. So we keep it focused on how to change the work, talent, and culture of advertising, which is a broad topic. And so we never really have any trouble there. Uh, housekeeping items done. Now you know what to expect. We're going to join the conversation with our wonderful guests uh, already in progress. Notion of expending energy to um, pronounce your transness to the world in a way that's legible. I remember when I first started interning as well, I would wake up at like, got a, like six o'clock in the morning just so I could like wear makeup um, and like essentially present myself as non-binary. I think as of late, we have a very um, acute understanding of what trans people, um, like how, like of transness, but I don't think we've quite cracked what it means to be non-binary. And I think people are so quick to kind of prescribe, um, whether it's like phenotypically or like little heuristics that like cue to them, like, oh, this person's non-binary. And for so the longest time, especially when I was early on in my career, I spent so much energy trying to perform my non-binary identity because I wanted to stop being questioned. Um, what, what, what is that? You know, what is they, them pronouns? And I was like, this is what it is. <laughs> like this eyeshadow and this earring, this one dangly earring. So I really do commiserate with the kind of expended efforts in trying to proclaim transness in a way that's legible for other people and how much, how taxing that can be for a lot of people who are especially kind of new to their trans um, identity. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the advertising and marketing industries um, can be, they're, they're very just bro -y, you know? Okay. So when you're on sets, especially like content production and film, like, you know, men can be like really disrespectful and even women, I mean, it's just, you're constantly misgendered and dealing with it. Um, so being non-binary, yeah, or in trans is, is super, super difficult, but I do think that you know, I try to, as the Sagittarius that I am, remain optimistic uh, that we're getting a little better. Okay. I have been noticing people asking, uh, cisgender people specifically asking, when I arrive to a meeting, hey, what's your pronoun? Or correcting themselves more on set or in a meeting or wherever it may be. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, yeah, you know, like whatever everybody says, we have a long way to go, but I have been noticing over, you know, because when I arrived in New York in 2012, just the past eight years, it, it has some little, little things, <laughs> <laughs> little like steps. Absolutely. So uh, my question for you is, you know, I don't know if you've been noticing all these articles like BuzzFeed and stuff like Gen Z versus millennials and Gen X and everything. Like, what is it like as a younger person? I mean, I'm 30, you're 24, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's not a huge difference, but I'm just curious. I mean, your experience must be different than mine. So what is it like as a younger person in the industry? You know, funny question or fun, funny thing. I really thought I was a millennial for a really long time until I entered marketing, which like obviously places much more strict like stricter parameters on what's considered Gen Z and what's millennial. And I remember I was so dumbfounded when I unfortunately found out that I am Gen Z, which I am now very fortunate of, um, especially considering that as an activist on my college campus who was already so empowered as a young person, I remember I was a senior in college and then, then started watching Emma Gonzalez and the Parkland Five, who I think were like only 16, 17 at the time. And, you know, especially I think by that time, by the time I was a senior, we had already kind of lived through two years of Trump's presidency, and I was really starting to feel very disillusioned and burnt out. And then the reinvigoration I felt from watching young people harness their power, um, the very little capital they have, into crafting this incredibly infectious and powerful message that older people should um, rally behind was something that was so incredibly important to me. Um, and it's just that that courage that I see from young people is something that I also wish to um, kind of bring more into the workplace, knowing that also at a company like Sparks and Honey, where it is actually very democratic and horizontal, um, my opinion as a young person really matters just as much as someone who has had 10 to 12 years of experience. Um, and so even within work, I see myself frequently being kind of tapped into as the residential Gen Z expert. and you know, there are times that it's very daunting to be put inside, you know, big client presentations with like 300 people um, having to, you know, perform this leadership as a Gen Z person. But also I have to remind myself that there is a unique set of lived experiences that only I could bring to the table as a young person. Um, and just kind of adding on to this a little bit, because I have been so... Um, I've been very um, excited and invigorated by young people for a very long time, but I've also taken on the responsibility of um, being a programming director for Alpha Undergrad, which essentially aims to kind of um, hone the next leaders, the next corporate leaders of America. And I have to say, it is so incredible, um, having been a part of the organization for the past five years, watching year by year incrementally just how much um, more excellent our student base is becoming. We have people who are now like, TED Talk speakers, literally people in college who are starting their own businesses and doing all these great things and like are really defining what it means to be, um, what, what, what queer excellence means. And at the same time, they're also so unapologetic in their demands for what the workplace should look like and are also very conscious of the fact that they're not going to go into a workplace that um, does not center trans people. They are not going to um, go into workplaces that have ableist policies. And so just watching that um, passion and that, you know, um, and it's just such self-awareness at a young age is something that I'm incredibly proud to like be a part of in this whole Gen Z kind of blossoming moment. I know that was really long, um, but I get very passionate when I talk about empowering young people. Um, so that's that. Um, but of course, um, with that, you know, something that I really struggle with, especially as someone who is constantly advocating for um, hiring more trans people in the workplace, specifically like young trans people, um, because we really do need to start, you know, welcoming trans talent into our walls because we're fucking incredible. Um, but, you know, I have my own kind of pointers that I like to use about why we should hire trans and like LGBTQ people. But I'm wondering if you have any other kind of pointers or examples or like specific times where your queer identity has really bolstered your creativity and has, ha and has helped improve business. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't have a specific moment where I'm like, oh, the fact that I'm queer has changed everything. I think that queer people, 
and I'm very biased, obviously, um, have this amazing capability to be open-minded and importantly to me, intersectional. I think there's a lot of self-education that happens in the queer community and we want to understand other communities and elevate each other. So I think that that really improves businesses, at least, you know, from our clients, because when we come to a client, we have a super diverse team with a lot of different lived experiences and perspectives. Um, and that, you know, as we all know, the research is rampant across the industry, like having diverse minds in the room, behind the camera, in front of the camera, so to speak, improves the bottom line, which shouldn't be the driver like it's just the right thing to do um but unfortunately that's you know what people especially you know business owners look for um so i feel like just being queer it has helped in a sense that you know de people definitely come to us because they want our perspective at posture like posture is a queer non-binary and qtpoc owned company so we are a bit different in the landscape. So it has definitely helped um, on our side improve business because people seek us out and they're like, we see that the, the value that you can bring and the, you know, because of your values and because of your mission and purpose um, that a lot of other creative agencies don't practice to be honest. Okay. So okay. it helps us and it also helps the client because we're helping making sure that the client is getting on the ground, culturally relevant information and honest opinions about what might be really offensive and how they can you know, proactively change and do better, which only helps grow businesses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. But what about you? It's really interesting. Um, so before I joined Sparks and Honey, obviously to prepare for having a trans employee kind of enter their walls, our company actually kind of rather early on institutionalized the use of um, um, pronouns in our email signatures and actually found much more interesting work from clients coming our way. Specifically, we have really big beauty clients who are interested in kind of shifting gender norms and how that'll affect the beauty industry as well as tech clients who are just really interested in everything Gen Z related. Um, and so as a trans person, um, a kind of skill that I think I bring to the table is that, of course, as young trans folk, you know, obviously we don't have as much like in real life connections to other trans people and often have to rely on virtual digital forums. So I grew up a fucking Tumblr whiz. I was like all over that. Um, was on Facebook at like the age of like seven, like was on MySpace when I probably way too early. And essentially from having like all those years of touching so many different communities because I had to for survival as a trans person has just kind of really equipped me with this um, astute knowledge of how like internet culture works that I think is actually really beneficial to a lot of marketing companies. Um, trans people are fucking amazing at social listening because we have to do that. Like we have literally done that as a, as a form of survival for so long. Um, and so from that end, on a skill set level, um, we are able to bring this, you know, astuteness of what's going on in culture that is very innate to us. And then also from the client end, um, for example, like our beauty client is really interested in how, you know, obviously as gender is evolving and um, gender identities are that much more expensive than ever before, how they should navigate that. And, you know, from my experiences as a queer person, I've been able to like offer some real interesting insights, for example, like things like gender neutral, um, like personal care products like shampoo um, and like conditioner are not only, um, you know, for the sake of being gender neutral, but they also kind of help like alleviate really rigid gender norms around like personal care. And so in that example, especially with like the upcoming or a pending recession heading our way, you know, like I was able to like tell our clients, you know, it's not just gender neutral, like personal care for the sake of it, but also that it could be also be like messaged as like, like personal care items that could be shared by anyone in the household. You know, you could like drastically save like shelf space. And so I think that gender is a really important um, window into larger conversations that we can have. And of course the people that are most equipped to have these conversations are LGBTQ people. Um, so that's that. <laughs>
absolutely. I love that. I think um, you said it so beautifully. There's a lot of money to be saved for businesses to not have to to segregate themselves in two different ways. And, you know, as queer people and trans people, we just by nature think differently and think outside the box and bring like unique perspectives. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot to be, to be had there. I love that. So while we're on the topic of brands, um, I would love to know, like, from your point of view, what can brands do to better support the LGBTQ community, specifically the trans community? That's what I care about. Um, so I want to start there. Yeah, I mean, the first and most obvious thing is hiring trans talent. And whether that's on your in-house team or hiring agencies that have trans people, whatever that, you know, whatever that looks like, um, definitely providing opportunities for career growth and empowerment is crucial, in my opinion. Um, that's why I do what I do. And the brands, um, you know, well, when I, I speak all year, not obviously not this year, about letting people tell their own stories too. Um, so it gets down to if you're trying to be diverse, you know, casting the right people, if you're talking about transness and non-binariness, like have trans and non-binary people in the room writing these projects. Like it is, it is so crucial. Do not have your typical cis team working on these projects. Like you need to bring in consultants and creative partners on everything you do. Um, and it will only help the brand because people will see the effort that's been put in and they'll see like, oh, this really resonates with me. It's not just another like corporate attempt to get my money, um, which is another thing. I mean, you know, because of COVID this year, I saw all over social people were being like, you know, it's funny, like we're not out spending money. So there's a, there are a lot less companies doing pride campaigns and supposedly advocating for support of these communities. Um, and I, you know, that shows your colors too. As a brand, you need to stay true to your values and really, you know, you know what pride is, right? And it should be all year long, but like you should have your schedule and you, you should find creative ways to advocate for these communities, even when it seems like there's nothing immediately in it for you, like an immediate return. Um, Cause I think, you know, a lot of brands are gonna suffer because they're like, oh, where are you? You don't have your flow in the parade. Um, but you know, you could have given grants or you could have really been in the community and made a difference during a really difficult time. So I think a lot of brands miss the boat on that. Um, and something that's just super personal to me when we talk about brands, like I can't tell you how many people come to us as an agency and they're like, okay, we need to do a LGBT campaign um, and, or a Black Lives Matter campaign or whatever it is. We have $5 and we have four days. You know, it's like, it's, um, I'm laughing, but it's really insulting and it's really sad, okay? Because you can't come to, <laughs> you can't come to these communities and these agencies and be like, we want to do something right now. Like, um, you should, as a brand, have your calendar planned out and be thoughtful in your approach to connecting with diverse communities and give it the time that it deserves because people see through when your shit is slapped together. Right. Um, so I could go on about this all day, but I will, you know, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, what about you? I mean, what can brands do better? What are some of your biggest frustrations that you see? You know, this is a hot take, especially as someone who works in the industry. But quite honestly, as a trans person, I don't give a fuck about brands. Um, at the end of the day, brands are not people. Um, and I think what's really paralyzing for me is seeing this like really incredible messaging come out, you know, from one angle. And then next thing I know, I find out that, you know, they fired a trans employee or like voted for like the supported Trump. Like it's all these intricate layers that, you know, obviously are like surround brands that it is very hard for me to really rally behind brands and um, think about them as entities that will protect me. Um, and so if you're a brand watching this, you know, <laughs> keep that in mind that trans people um, for very obvious reasons have a lot of distrust towards more kind of formal institutions. And I think that is something that um, collectively we all need to interrogate is how to amend this broken trust um, especially after years and years of injustice and failure to um, respond to our pain in a way that's adequate. 
Um, that said, I love when brands kind of act quietly or uh, like speak quietly. I don't know. What, what am I trying to, I'm ESL, help me out here. But essentially when they kind of do all the work behind the scenes without making so, such a big kind of commotion about it. And then maybe it is through like organic, like Twitter posts of people talking about this moment that happened. Um, I prefer that very much over some really loud, like rainbow washed pride moment. Um, but I actually want to kind of circle back to what you were kind of starting to talk about, which is the idea that like this labor of like DNI, like consulting is often very undervalued. Um, and that is certainly one of my biggest frustrations about the industry is that oftentimes as a young queer person, um, I'm expected to like speak on my transness for free. But I'm wondering if that is also something that is really resonant to you and if you have any other frustrations about the state of the industry right now. Yeah. Um, you know, when I started Posture and I was 23 or 22, um, I was definitely naive and definitely did a lot for free. Um, but now that I've been in the game for a little while, I can tell you that I started to, you know, really advocate for myself and my team and be like, this is what we're worth this is our rate for xyz and really just lay out um how you know what what our time is worth because it's not just the hour we're consulting or whatever it's a lifetime it's a lifetime of unpacking trauma and emotions and situations and issues and it's it's we're bringing all that together in a way that someone else who has no idea what it's like can understand in a very short amount of time it takes a lot of skill. Um, and so it should be compensated for. Um, and yeah, so it's frustrating, but yeah, I mean, we, we are really lucky and privileged to be in the position where we do turn away work when it's not the right fit or someone doesn't see our value. Um, you know, it's just, it has to be that way. We don't, we can't allow ourselves to get run over in this industry because we have had, I personally, again, have had a lot of experience with tokenization, with being, you know, people bringing posture in or me in to be like, oh, look, we're cool, we're relevant, we're caring, but then not really, not coming through 100% on that. And it really being a lot of just like hot air. Um, so it comes down to being really smart and having strict guidelines for yourself on your personal time labor and emotional labor. Mm -hmm. To that point about tokenization, I mean, that is something that I'm very actively grappling with and I have been for the past two years. You know, I'm only 24, kind of, it's been two years since I've graduated college and I've been sort of thrust into the spotlight because um, I'm one of very few non-binary people in the industry. And on the one hand, it's been very difficult kind of reconciling the fact that I love that I'm currently able to build all this capital um, and also have the platform to um, speak on issues pertaining to trans and non-binary identities and experiences. But on the other hand, you know, especially coupled in with the fact that I'm such a young person who is still working through so much imposter syndrome, um, like even like, going to Cannes, for example, like that is an opportunity that is should, so that should be so celebrated. But honestly, like I hated Cannes because I felt like the entire experience there, I one had to prove my worth as a young person in that space, but also that I was a valid trans person. Um, and that, you know, like I was not some novel kind of circus item that was kind of interjected into the space because the times needed it, but also, but that like, I should be there because I'm excellent. Um, and so essentially like, I've really been grappling with this idea of like tokenization, you know, I really enjoy this limelight, but also like, it just can feel very exploitative sometimes. And I'm wondering if you have any advice um, for young people who, you know, kind of sit at the cross fire of, or crosshairs of like being tokenized and like, you know, kind of finding their way up, but also like the labor of having to represent entire communities and kind of carry that weight on their back. Yeah. Yeah, something for me, I just immediately say like, first of all, I cannot represent my entire community. 
Okay, like that's impossible. So I usually advocate to have a team of consultants on with different experiences because that's going to be a broader set. Um, and my, my biggest advice is literally to just ask, well, I'm happy to do this for you or I'm happy to discuss this. My rate is X or do not be scared of asking. I'm just curious what your budget is for this. Um, you know, your time is super valuable. And I wish that someone had really ingrained that in me as a young person, um, because now I know. But even, but June, even I have imposter syndrome today and people who are 50, 70 and 80, 100 have imposter syndrome. I don't think that ever goes away, especially in our community, because you feel like you constantly don't belong and you're constantly having to prove yourself. Um, but I think just, just doing your best to let go of the fear and realize that, they need you a lot more than you need them. Mm. And that's the biggest thing I can tell young people is like you represent a wealth of knowledge and experience that these people are desperate to get. So know your worth and really figure out, you know, what your value is and what, it, what's just, what's worthwhile for you to educate or do anything, give your time at all. Yeah. Yes. Yes. God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, June, I think, I think we're almost out of time, but I'm just curious, um, what are you most hopeful for? You know, again, coming back to this notion of hope as the Sag, like in this industry, like what are you looking forward to? You know, as an Asian person, I must be the generational trauma. Um, I really get fixated on this idea of like, um, like generational kind of giving and like also learning from the people who come before me. And I think, especially as I kind of enter my career and also start to identify one, all the incredible trans people who have come before me, like you, we have an incredible non-binary black femme at my own um, company, her name, or their name is Kendra Clark. And to see that, you know, there are like non-binary people have been here and, you know, we're only just now getting started and we're gonna rock this shit is just really exciting. And then kind of dovetailing that is the other piece where as I work with so many young people with organizations, organizations like O4U um, and see so many young trans people who are so resolute in their identities and are so unapologetic in their demands to feel safe and celebrated at work, that energy is so contagious and it also liberates everyone else within whatever space we're in. And so the kind of culmination of like seeing all these incredible trans predecessors who have paved the way and also this like kind of emergent you know upswing of young people who are equally as um, passionate and creating space for themselves has just been really exciting to witness and that is what has been giving me the most hope and of course like the Gemini I am I must ask you about your hopes as well <laughs> yeah um my hopes are just that people keep do, doing a bit more self-educating and being a lot more intentional about wealth redistribution mm. um, and access and power and privilege right. and really giving that thought versus just like, you know, hiring people who look like you, or not you, but hiring someone who might hire someone that looks just like them mm -hmm. and does what's comfortable. Like my hope is that people will continually step out of their comfort zone and really think about how they can impart change with the privilege they have. Um, yeah, that's, I, that's all I want to see <laughs> in this industry. There's I'm so, so much so, wealth, you know, that can be distributed appropriately. I'm so happy that the word privilege made its way into this conversation. Very important word that we need to actively interrogate constantly. <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, are we moving? Guys. Yeah, it's the omniscient voice um, from the heavens here to tell you that we have some questions. Um, so I want to give some time to allow you guys to answer. Um, first, June, you talked a lot about, um, you know, brands and your distaste for them or lack of under a lack of understanding that you feel from them. What could they possibly do? What could more brands do to make you care about them and build loyalty? Like what would be... Um, what would what would make you care more deeply what they what their opinions are yeah you know culture is always in flux that said there are always these like really key temple moments that require 
more urgency than other situations, the latest being obviously the recent kind of resurgence and revolution regarding the Black Lives Matter movement. And even within that, you know, I think a lot of trans people are very, uh, are keeping an eye out for how brands are responding, um, subconsciously or consciously, I don't know. But when these moments of crises emerge where specifically trans folks are hurting, um, I would love to see more brands um, rally behind trans people in ways beyond just messaging. I would love to see, like time and time again, a lot of activists um, like literally proclaim that the biggest help that they could receive um, specifically towards trans communities is monetary and kind of capital um, assistance. And I would just love to see more brands rally around the kind of direct needs that um, are um, asked of from trans folk rather than like some feel good rainbow wash, like love is love bullshit. <laughs> Winter, do you have any ads? Oh gosh, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at is I don't, yeah, messaging is amazing. Like I, you know, we want to see ourselves represented and it's super critical and beautiful, but I want something behind that. I want community organizing and partnerships that make an actual difference in trans people's lives. So I definitely think, you know, that's what brands need to do is to ask themselves, how can we impart real change? Like I said. Right. Taking, taking, you know, representation is, is one step and that's great. But uh, how are you actually taking strides to support? I mean, it's a similar conversation to, you know, uh, Pride Month when all the brands become rainbows and you're like, but what is your actual connection to the queer community and how are you supporting them? Whether that's monetarily or, you know, putting structures in place to help youth, et cetera. Um, just making it, a more well-rounded campaign, if you will. <laughs> um, and it actually leads me to uh, the next question, which is pretty interesting. Um, as we do start to see some more representation and, you know, again, not necessarily the follow through that we would all want, but representation is a step in the right direction. But as we start to see that, do you think we'll start to see the same kind of gap of representation between trans men and trans women as we do with cis men and cis women? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. I think that it's a really hard question to answer because I think like trans masculine people are, you know, face a completely different set of challenges than trans women. So I think the stories and the narratives are going to be very different. I think there's something to be said, like, at least, you know, again, I can speak to my experience. Like if I present a little more masculine, like there's definitely a shift in the way I'm treated that I imagine is extremely different than June. Like some, like you might be treated very differently than me if I come in looking like a 12 year old boy and that's like more accepted than what you face. I think that in my personal opinion, like trans women need more, not need, I, I want to be careful with this, but I think there will be a gap and I think they will be, there will be different treatment because as we know, trans women, specifically trans women of color are killed at record high rates. So I think there needs to be, you know, different levels of attention paid to the different issues at hand. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I would say another worry I have is that trans people are just going to be reduced to a monolith and essentially like we are just going to be given trans characters um, with the idea that we should be appeased at the idea that there are more trans characters without any um, attention to the nuanced ways that you know trans masculine people versus trans um, feminine people live completely different lives and so on the flip side I also worry that like it might just become like oh trans more trans characters on camera um, as opposed to like a more um, detailed analysis <laughs> Yeah, the experiences are, are unique. So yeah, it's like June, exactly. It can't just be this like huge oversimplification of the trans experience. Right. Right, I think a lot of brands, I mean, that's just a general thing, right? That all brands struggle with in terms of, we're trying to speak to a very specific group of people, but anytime you group people, you're doing the individuals a disservice. So, you know, I think that's, that's pretty crucial um, to note. Uh, I am going to bring Graham back in here. All right. 
Um, before Q and A is formally done, and before I thank you, I actually have a question. Uh, it's intentionally hard, but fun, I think. Um, so all of this, a lot of this conversation hinges around like real commitment to action, real cultural change, real like brand investment. Let's say by you, you magically each won a grant tomorrow and that grant was for a million dollars just to fix the, you know, the issue from your perspective in terms of like how we can advance this business. Where do you, where do you put that money? Jared, do you want to take it or should I? You know what? I can. Um, actually, this is, you know what? I might as well manifest this into existence. Um, <laughs> but this one's the mood board. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are familiar with the um, organization called MAPE. It's the Multicultural Advertising Intern Program, which essentially um, houses students across the country for the summer and provides them with internships and matches them with obviously the best companies. Um, and while I was in LA, um, there was another organization who did a very similar thing, this time kind of centering more on um, displaced people who are currently um, without um, housing. And so obviously, as we continue to think about the fact that, you know, trans people um, have record high numbers in the homelessness rates and also like don't have as much access to like higher education um, as a lot of as, as just as, as people do. Um, one thing I've been really thinking about is that at the bottom line, I would just love to get more trans people um, housed. And so the grant, whatever situation that would be, like I would love if there was, if there was a perfect kind of existing foundation, it would be something that ultimately a bottom line housed trans people um, and then provided them with internship, built their capital up and then like at the very top, if this was like to be compared to like Maslow's needs of hierarchy, at the very top would be like something around how the fact that obviously as we have more trans talent in the walls, um, we are able to then communicate to trans consumers better. But like, like I would love trans people off the streets and housed and to distribute capital in a way that's much more um, long, long term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Winter, what about you? You're on the hot spot, hot seat. Yeah, um. I, know. I know exactly. I mean, that, I agree. I mean, homelessness is a huge issue, I think. So we just launched an initiative that was a brand sponsorship for a black owned business or um, entrepreneur, where we are providing a complete branding package to get someone's business off the ground and give them the knowledge they need to succeed and take it to the next level. Um, and that's something I'm really passionate about is helping people become business owners and entrepreneurs and take control of their lives. And also, again, be part of the ecosystem of redistributing this capital and having the ability to hire people in, the, in their own communities and really raise each other up and build, you know, uh, this really amazing, powerful network of people that can, um, continue to provide jobs and continue to support each other and educate each other and mentor each other and fund each other. So if I had a million dollars, I would definitely do more um, sponsorships like that, like where we would just really continue to help build companies with nothing in it for us, just to get people, you know, off the, off the ground and give them the knowledge they need to succeed as well as continued support, right? Not just, out the gate, here's the foundation of your brand, here's all the tools, goodbye, good luck. Like it would be, a, be have the resources and the team available to continually foster that relationship and give them the mentorship that really every you know, business owner needs. So that is what I would do for sure. Well, now I need to like start a lemonade stand or a car wash or something <laughs> so I can raise what we'll call the queer millions fund and then we'll just see what we can do. Um, your answers there are representative of uh, the entire conversation and, and and truly like reflective of what we are trying to do as an organization in that um, we're trying to connect um, the big picture business dynamics to personal accountability to personal kindness 
Um, every single thing that you brought up uh, today in the context of like what needs to be fixed in the industry, like the culture of our business, you were able to tie to very personal examples, which we are so grateful for you for sharing. Um, uh, so thank you for sharing with us and thank you for sharing with each other. And this was a wonderful conversation. So um, before all the housekeeping I wanted to say, you're amazing. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for having me as well. Winter, you're amazing. I was like fangirling on this side. <laughs> like I'm sweating so bad right now. <laughs> we're, the, you we're, know, we're really lucky to have you as, you know, an advocate in the community. You're incredible. We're gonna well, fangirl are, offline. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. All the all the episodes of Hey Fam have this like BFF energy and, and that's it's it's so indicative of like of why we also need to come together. Like, you know, there's only so much that we could do with affinity groups, as amazing as affinity groups are. So our ability to band together and connect across the industry is something that we hope to support. So thank you for being wonderful examples of that. Um, we, uh, that's it for this week's episode of Do the Work. Uh, to check out the next episode, find the schedule at dothework.com and that's work spelled W-E-R-Q for those of you who don't know yet. We're taking a break from open office hours tomorrow, but keep an eye out for next week's programming, which will be wonderful. Um, at the website, you can also sign up for more email updates and community connection activities. Um, and you can also reach out to us via the site when you personally just sort of want to step up, become part of conversations like these, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm having like a ton of conversations all week with people who are just like, I want to be a part of this. And so we're trying to help them be a part of this. Uh, and please follow us at do the work on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, you can find us on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Thank you again for watching. Thank you again to our guests and to our audience for uh, sticking with us through this slight glitch at the beginning of the broadcast and uh, for all your questions today. Bye. Hey.